Well, these are today's figures, just in case there was anyone still in any doubt if we're heading into a difficult winter. And these are per capita cases, per million cases in this case. And we see that the Czech Republic and Belgium have very high levels. But we notice the steepness of the lines. Cases are going up very quickly. Then France and the Netherlands next in their own little cluster there. Then they kind of becomes a, another group here in per capita figures. Spain, Poland, the United Kingdom, Italy and the United States. In terms of per capita figures, we could call them another cluster, I think, there, really. The United States is at the bottom, so less cases per capita per day in the United States than all these countries above but slightly more than Germany and slightly more than Sweden. But Germany just recently announcing it's going into an effectively another short-term lockdown from Monday. So they are the increases in cases that we have at the moment. Now, you are very welcome to this video, as you always are. Now, what I'm going to do now, I've actually done this briefly on a TV interview, but it was so rushed, it's just frustrating and it's hardly worth bothering with. So I want to do this properly now. But for those of you really boring people out there that don't want to go through this in detail, the bottom line is I'm going to give you, in terms of long-term immunity, because there's a lot of scare stories about this. People are saying you're only going to be immune for a few months and we're going to be reinfected and the antibodies go away. There's a lot of disinformation about this. So what I'm going to do is give you things directly from scientific papers. But the main takeaway message from this video is that people who were infected with SARS coronavirus type 1 back in 2003, in the first coronavirus pandemic that was curtailed fairly quickly, only about 8,000 people were infected. But the point is, the memory T cells that people acquired in 2003, they still have now and are still active. And those memory T cells give people, we believe, immunity against SARS coronavirus 1, 17 years later. Now, we don't know that because there is no SARS coronavirus 1 in the world. It's gone. But those SARS coronavirus 1 memory T cells that these people have are active against SARS coronavirus 2. Two. Now, it doesn't change world epidemiology very much because, as we said, only about 8,000 people were infected with SARS coronavirus 1. But it does show this long term immune response. Now, there's still argument, there's still debate. So, what I want to do is go to the scientific evidence and give you what I've got on it. And I am very optimistic about long term immunity, and this is the reason for it. So if you're boring, if you've got something better to do, trot off and do it. If not, I would love to have you. And uh, we'll go through this in, in a bit of detail. It is remarkably interesting, actually, and very, very hopeful. Now, um, coronavirus antibody prevalence falling in England is the title of the paper. And this is part of the REACT study. Now, the REACT study is uh, an ongoing study, and it's how people react to the virus. So they get the virus, how do they react? And of course... The immune system reacts by producing antibodies, which are the immunoglobulins, which are the immune proteins, important in many forms of infections, as we know. Now, this is carried out, this study, by Imperial College London and the Ipse More polling people. And if these Ipse More people, these polling people know anything, it's how to pick a random sample. So this data is, is pretty good. I'm pretty comfortable with the quality of this data. They've taken antibodies, the finger prick antibody tests, from 365,000 people. And they've got well over 17,000 positive tests back. So this is big sample size stuff. This is good quality quantitative science. Now, interesting, first thing to note is 30% of the people that tested positive for the antibodies did not report any symptoms. So this is giving a 30% asymptomatic rate. These people had the antibodies. They'd definitely been exposed to SARS coronavirus 2, which causes COVID-19, but they'd had no symptoms. They'd been asymptomatic. So slightly higher level of asymptomatic people than we had thought. 
uh, encouraging in one way but a problem in another because they could be going around their daily lives feeling fine yet infecting others some of them could even have been super spreaders we don't know but that's sort of interesting 30% asymptomatic so now this study went on for a good three months slightly more 20th of June to the 28th of September so quite a long study and it was in three rounds in other words they did blood tests at the start blood tests in the middle and blood tests at the end to detect for the presence of the antibodies to SARS coronavirus 2 now there was a decline between round one and round three in all age groups in the amount of antibodies. This simple prick test, finger prick test, just tests for the presence of the antibodies. They're either there or they're not. And the decline was largest in people who didn't report a history of COVID-19. So the antibodies were falling away more quickly in people who had asymptomatic disease. And this is the first thing that really pricked up my interest and gave me a lot of hope. Because what seems to happen is someone gets this virus. And hopefully, normally, the T-cell response gets rid of it really quickly before the body's had time to make antibodies. If the T-cell response doesn't get rid of it really quickly, the body goes on to make antibodies and hopefully the antibodies will get rid of it. So already you can see that antibodies are there in people that probably have longer lasting illness. And the amount of antibodies in people that are sicker is also higher. So antibodies already might be a sign of failure of other aspects of the immune system, such as these memory T lymphocytes that are so important, as we've looked at quite a few times on this channel, at eradicating virally infected cells. They're called cytotoxic T cells. They will just kill virally infected cells and other cells will do the same, such as the large lymphocytes which are the natural killer cells the nk cells so already it's in encouraging so the antibodies dropped off quickest in people that were asymptomatic probably because they had less antibodies to begin with probably because the t cells had got rid of the virus and stopped them getting the clinical features in the first place so already i've kind of downplayed the importance of uh, antibodies in this infection asymptomatics People with no symptoms, uh, the antibodies dropped by 64% between round one and round three. So a very, very quick drop off in antibody levels. But these people had never suffered clinical features of the disease, but they had been infected by the virus. Therefore, they must have got rid of the virus in another way. Therefore, other arms of the immune system must have got rid of the virus. And that is probably largely the memory T cells, although there probably will be some memory B cells as well, and there'll also be immunoglobulin type A's in the mucous membranes because it's not just antibodies that get rid of the virus, it's different arms of the immune system. The immune system has reserve forces, it's absolutely brilliant the way it works. Now, um, in the antigen diagnosed group, so these were patients that are actually diagnosed who had the antigen. And remember, this was a total of 17,576 patients. Uh, so this is a big study. All individuals, they weren't all patients, of course. Um, in this group, generally, there was a 22.3% reduction between round one and round three. The antibodies were dropping off quickly. Uh, fairly quickly, 22.3% drop off over three months. Not 22.3 drop off in the number of viruses, uh, the number of antibodies present, but a 22.3% drop off in the number of people testing positive for the antibody. So that had gone down quite dramatically. And what the overall decline actually was, um, the percentage testing positive was 6% in round one at the start of the three months, 4.8% halfway through and down to 4.4% still testing positive after three months. So there was a continuous reduction in the number of people who still had enough antibodies in the blood to register positive on this test. More and more people were losing the antibodies that they had produced. And of course, losing the antibodies tells you nothing about the memory T cells because that is a much more sophisticated laboratory based test. It's not a single simple finger prick test as the antibody test is. 
Um, all areas of the country and age groups uh, were found to have antibodies. London was the highest. They found 9% in London at round three. Now, it probably had been higher in London. It was probably higher than that. I've seen estimates of about 18%, but of course the antibodies are lost over time. Now, interesting, the decline was not seen in healthcare workers. And yet these healthcare workers had not reported getting sick again. So in other words, healthcare workers, nurses and doctors, they went to work or via some other way, they got infected with the virus, they made antibodies, they had, those, they had their antibodies checked and then three months later the antibodies, the same proportion of healthcare workers, also tested positive for antibodies. Now is there some reason why healthcare workers should carry on making antibodies longer than anyone else? Of course not. So why did the healthcare workers have antibodies? at the same level at the start of the study, as a, 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 the, at the same level at the end of the study as at the start of the study? Well, to me, the answer is that they've been re-exposed to the virus at work. When they were re-exposed to the virus, they made fresh antibodies, so they were still testing positive for the antibodies, but they hadn't reported being sick. So these people have probably been re-exposed to the virus. They had a form of secondary infection, uh, but they weren't sick because the T-cells had eradicated it quickly, quickly enough for them not to get sick, but not quickly enough so they made a few extra antibodies. That might not be true, but that explanation makes perfect sense. So this is very encouraging for reinfection. The vast majority of people that are re-exposed to the virus will not have clinical illness based on this health worker data that we have so far. Decline was largest in people aged 75 and older. No surprise there at all. No surprise whatsoever because the immune response is not as effective in older people. It is that simple. And the antibody response is part of that. Again, it tells us nothing about the T-cell response in older people. We would expect it to be less effective than in younger people. But this study simply does not report on that. So we don't know. Now, one of the lead professors in this study... Paul, uh, Professor Paul Elliott, our study shows that over time there is a reduction in the proportion of people testing positive for the antibodies. So this is not testing for the number of antibodies, it's the proportion of people testing positive for the antibodies. <clears throat> so that's what he says, that makes sense. Testing positive for antibodies does not mean you're immune to COVID-19. Interesting. Uh, he's saying they have no evidence that antibodies are conferring immunity. Don't want to put words in his mouth, but that's interesting that he's saying that. Um, it remains unclear what level of immunity antibodies provide or for how long this immunity lasts. OK, that is true. He's going by the scientific data. Um, but I'm going to give evidence that indicates he's being somewhat pessimistic there. Um, if someone tests positive for antibodies, uh, now this is important. I agree 100% with this. The professor again. Uh, they still need to follow uh, national guidelines, including social distancing, getting a swab test if they have symptoms, wearing face coverings. In other words, they have to behave as normal because there's a lot of things we don't know yet. So I agree completely for that. Now, what are the implications here for immunity? Now, this is where it gets really interesting. And first, we have to do a little bit of revision and go back to the first coronavirus pandemic started in November 2003 it was all wrapped up no started in November 2002 it was all wrapped up by 2003 so just a bit of revision on that, that that's the SARS what sometime it, well it's the SARS and it's a it's a coronavirus um, and uh, that's that's all it's called but what I what I like to do is call it the SARS coronavirus one to, to differentiate from what we have now, which is the SARS coronavirus 2. Now, this infected about 8,000 people around the world, at least, of course, there was many more than that. Again, many weren't diagnosed, 774 deaths. But the big difference with the SARS coronavirus 1, as I call it, um, the big difference is that people shed most virus when they were most sick. So you could see people that were sick and isolate them and it was much easier to contain this virus. And it was contained. No vaccine has ever been developed for it because the infection went away. Because it was much easier to contain. It's the big difference with SARS coronavirus 
Two is that people spread the disease when they are asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic and minimally symptomatic. That was not the case with SARS coronavirus 1 in 2003. It was spread mostly by the sickest people. So once that was realised, it was relatively easy to isolate the sickest people. Um, now, the virus, as we said, it only was curtailed 8,000 people. Um, started in um, Guangdong in southern China. It must have flown its way to Toronto, <coughs> Hong Kong, Taipei, Singapore, Hanoi in Vietnam. So it got to Canada in Vietnam, but um, it was curtailed. So, so, so that's interesting. That was 2003. Now, why am I telling you about that? Well, there's been studies done. Uh, SARS coronavirus 2, specific T cell immunity in cases of COVID-19 and SARS. And when they say SARS there, they mean SARS coronavirus type 1. That's why it gets a bit confusing. I wish they'd call it 1 the same as me. So SARS coronavirus 2, that's what's causing the current COVID-19 pandemic. SARS, plain old SARS, is what caused the 2003 pandemic, what I call SARS 1 to differentiate it from SARS coronavirus 2. Published in Nature, very prestigious. Memory T cells induced by previous pathogens can greatly influence future infections. So without going into the immunity in great detail, these memory T cells are white blood cells that will recognise the presence of virally infected cells and eradicate that cell, therefore eradicating the viruses, therefore there's no living viruses to spread the infection. So massively important memory T cells. And they are memory cells, they're called memory cells because they can remember infections years and decades later in some infections. Now, um, individuals convalescing from SARS, uh, in invalescing from uh, COVID-19. Now, they took 36, they found 36, the number was only 36 here, but all had N protein. Now, the N protein is the nuclear capsid. So what you have... In, in, the vi in the virus, you have, you have the RNA in the middle, then you have this, uh, the capsid round about it, then you have the, the spikes, the infectious spikes sticking out of it. So what they found was the people who'd had uh, COVID-19, SARS coronavirus 2, all of those patients in this study, I know it's a limited study, but it's difficult tests. So they found, they found these 36 patients who had SARS coronavirus 2, they had the COVID-19, and they all had memory T cells that attack the capsular capsid proteins around about the virus. In other words, they're antiviral T cells. These T cells have learned how to recognize SARS coronavirus 2 in 100% of people that were infected. Now, a bigger sample size would be nice, of course, but 100% is a highly significant result. So they all had these nuclear capsid protein recognizing T cells. Now, this is a bit complicated, but what it means is they all had these these memory T cells, these immunological cells that recognize the capsule around about the virus. So what we, we have the RNA in the middle, as we know. Then we have the, uh, the, the, the cap, the, the, this capsule around about there like that. Then we have the, uh, in the, the infectious spikes off it like this. So these memory T cells are recognizing the proteins that make up this capsid around about here. So um, that's what they're recognising. But that's good. That will still allow them to recognise the viral fragments. So what will happen is um, here we'll have a, a cell. This is one of our body cells. Um, that's infected with the SARS coronavirus 2. Very small on this scale. Um, some of these proteins here will get to the surface of the cell. Some of these uh, nuclear capsid proteins will get to the surface of the cell. The memory T cell will see these proteins on the surface and as a result that memory T cell will destroy that cell. It's just respond. So which proteins in the virus it responds to doesn't matter too much because it's going to take out the whole cell anyway. So that was the case in SARS coronavirus 2 causing the current pandemic. All the patients developed memory T cells. So that's good. Now, what about uh, patients who recovered from SARS coronavirus 1, as I call it, COV1, 
In other words, the 2003 outbreak, SARS coronavirus 1, 2003. Now, they only found 23 patients there. But they all possess long-lasting memory T cells reactive to the N protein of the SARS coronavirus type 1. In other words, they were still able to recognise these proteins. The T, the T cells were able to recognise these proteins and therefore destroy cells should that infection raise its ugly head again. And these have lasted for 17 years. Now get this, this is, this, is, this is just so important. The last people to be infected with SARS coronavirus 1 was in 2003. Since then there's been none. There's been no infections. So we know they kind of developed it 10 years ago because SARS coronavirus 1 didn't exist then. It wasn't in the world. So these memory T cells have lasted for 17 years. 17 years. Um, they display robust cross-reactivity with the end protein of SARS coronavirus 2. In other words, the T cells in these 8,000 people or so that were infected with SARS coronavirus 1 way back in 2003, the T cells that they have produced will give them immunity against SARS coronavirus 2, the current pandemic. Now, we don't know that for sure. We haven't done the experiments, but the robust cross-reactivity would indicate that these people are immune to the current pandemic because they had this infection way back in 2003 and this immunity has lasted for 17 years. And the study authors said we also detected SARS coronavirus 2 specific T cells with individuals, as I've gone to the next piece of paper, um, with no history of SARS-1 or SARS-2. So in other words, they detected people with SARS coronavirus 2 specific T cells who had never been exposed to either of these viruses. So first thing to point out here is that people that had SARS coronavirus 1 are still immune to SARS coronavirus 1. People that had SARS coronavirus 1 still have the memory T cells 17 years later. People that had SARS coronavirus 1 show cross reactivity with the SARS coronavirus 2. Also, there was another group of people that they found when they were doing this study, only 37 of them, but they had memory T cells specific to SARS coronavirus 2, but they'd never been exposed to it. So where on earth did they get that, those specific T cells from? Well, what they found was that there are proteins in this nucleocapsid around about SARS coronavirus 2 that are the same as beta coronaviruses. <clears throat> so these people have presumably been exposed to beta coronaviruses. Therefore, it looks like they're immune to SARS coronavirus 2 and beta coronaviruses are found in animals. So what we need is a study that looks at people's contact with animals and their immunity to SARS coronavirus 2. Now, we don't have that, but again, it's interesting. It shows that exposure to animal beta coronaviruses raises long lived T cells, and these T cells have cross reactivity with SARS coronavirus 2. Hope that all makes sense. What, what, it, what it means is these T cells are lasting for a long time. Now, the T cells that we know that people generate in response to SARS coronavirus 2, we know these existed because all of that study, all of the 36 people in this study had them. They all had, remember that one, they all, they all, they all, had, they all, they all had that, they all had that one, didn't they? Uh, th this one, all had the N protein recognizing T cells. So they, they, all, they all had that. What we don't know is how long they, had. so we know they all got it, but we don't know how long it's gonna last for. Is it going to be 17 years the same as SARS coronavirus 1? Given the similarities in the virus, that is my suspicion. Now, are they only going to last for 17 years? Well, we've only had 17 years. <coughs> Excuse me. So we don't know. Um, they could last for 27 years, 37 years. We don't know. Um, with SARS coronavirus 1, we know they last for 17 of course, we don't know how long SARS coronavirus 2 are going to last because we haven't had the time yet. But it's promising. I think they're going to last for a long time. I'm reassured by this. Right, and some people with no previous exposure 
to SARS-1 or 2 or exposure to any of contacts. In other words, they had definitely no exposure. They had SARS uh, coronavirus 2 specific T cells uh, in uninfected donors who exhibited a different pattern of immunodominance. So in other words, these were reacting to different types of protein. So th there's the nuclear capsid there with the RNA and the infectious spikes. Now there's lots of different sorts of proteins make up this capsid roundabout. Lots of different proteins. So these people who presumably have been exposed to the beta coronaviruses were reacting to different ones. This is a bit complicated, but st stick with it because it's got a really important implication. So targeting different uh, nuclear capsid proteins, different end proteins. These proteins are very, very similar to the ones in beta coronaviruses. That's why we think that. But they are not similar. Homology similarity. They are not similar to the four coronaviruses that we know cause the common cold. So we have memory T cells generated to SARS coronavirus 1 2003, SARS coronavirus 2 um, 2019-2020 that we have now. The T cells are generated to that. The T cells are generated to the um, to the beta coronaviruses. But we do know that these common cold viruses, people can be reinfected continuously. Now, what people initially thought was, well, there's these four coronaviruses that cause the common cold. People can get reinfected with those every six months. Therefore, people can get reinfected with SARS coronavirus two every six months. Therefore, the immunity is not going to last for long. Now, you can believe that if you want, but I don't know of any specific evidence for it. But what I've given here is I've given evidence for SARS coronavirus 2 having cross reactivity with beta coronaviruses and SARS coronavirus 1. And we also know that SARS coronavirus 2 produces memory T cells. Therefore, what I'm saying is the immunological response to SARS coronavirus 2 is more similar to SARS coronavirus 1 and beta coronaviruses than it is to common cold coronaviruses. Therefore, I would expect the immunological response to SARS coronavirus 2 to be unlike the common cold viruses and to give us longer lasting immunity. Now in a year's time we can retest for these T cells and we'll know. As, as the latest data shows now those T cells are still present. That's why I'm optimistic about the immunity and I wanted to do this because there's so much fear mongering going on about this immunity not being long lasting. Um, but there's no evidence for the immunity being particularly short lasting. Um, but I believe I've given evidence for why the immunity should be long lasting. Based on these other viruses and things that we know. So infection with beta coronaviruses induces multi-pacific and long lasting T cell immunity against these proteins. So long lasting. So these two coronaviruses similar to SARS coronavirus 1, give long lasting immunity, thankfully. Now, last thing on this video, if you've stuck with that, well done, because I know it's complicated, but I just thought it was important to go through that. Um, what about vaccination? Well, we don't have the peer reviewed publications on the vaccines yet, but a couple of days ago, we did look at this release from AstraZeneca. Uh, the Oxford vaccine, of course, the uh, AZD1222 vaccine. And this is the paper we looked at a few days ago on this, on this video. Uh, it produced a strong immune response in the elderly. Immune response was similar in all age groups, surprisingly, but that was good. Um, but vitally, it produced antibodies, but it also produced memory T cells. So this vaccine is producing memory T cells and from what we know about the immunological reaction to this virus these memory T cells last a long time from what we know how long are these memory T cells going to last you know they could all disappear in a puff of smoke on the 1st of November we don't know that but I think it's very very unlikely given what we, we know Given what we know, I would expect they persist into the future and give longer lasting immunity. So just to summarise what we've said on this video, cases are going up 
as we know. Um, more lockdowns are being imposed in Europe, more restrictions are being imposed in Europe. Um, ongoing situation in the United States, it's going to be a difficult winter. But I, I believe that the immune response to people that catch this virus <clears throat> naturally in the wild, as is illustrated by those healthcare workers, is going to be long-lived. And I believe the immune response to the, vi to the vaccine is going to be long-lived as well. And I think I've given evidence that supports that. And I've argued strongly against the short-lived immunity response, where people, in my view, have been arguing wrongly from the four coronaviruses that cause the common cold. Right, well done. So I still believe uh, this time next year this virus is pretty well going to be history. There could be a few a few years where we get it from for a couple of years yet, but I, I think it's going to go away like SARS coronavirus one did. That's. I believe that's where the scientific evidence is pointing. Now, just before we finish this video, I'm going to show you something quite amazing. Um, this is Charles has done this um, done this drawing. He said, I've just done a quick sketch and uh, see if you can recognise who it's supposed to be. I think that's just incredible, don't you? Let me try and put the same expression on. Maybe not quite right. <clears throat> but anyway, um, I just thought that was an incredible... Um, you know, I've tried drawing drawing people before. And uh, let's just say I destroy all the evidence as quickly as possible. To actually draw someone who looks like someone is just incredibly difficult. So thank you for that, Charles. And I will put a link to Charles's Instagram if you'd like to browse some more of his absolutely excellent artwork. Thank you for watching as always. If you've stayed to the end of this one, well done. And I hope you do feel, um, well, you're going to feel concerned for the short term, but I, I do hope you now feel optimist, more optimistic about the long term as, as I do. Yeah, incredible. Wish I could draw like that. <laughs> Looks better than the original, if anything. So... Thank you for that, Charles. <laughs>